So good afternoon um, to uh, and welcome everybody um, to our Aspen um, fireside chat. And I'm seeing um, many, uh, many faces, many friends um, among you, um, among our participants, but I also see um, many new faces, um, which I'm delighted, delighted about. Um, to, so welcome um, to all of our newbies um, at our Aspen Fireside uh, chat. Um, I'm really excited um, that today um, we have a topic um, with which we have not um, dealt with so much in the past um, at Aspen. And I'm expecting to learn a lot today on a personal level, um, as well as um, on a professional level and on a content level. And the topic of today is, um, shedding light on social, racial, and economic justice. And we want to zoom in to the uh, topic of strategic litigation. Um, our fireside chat is a little bit of a different format um, than we usually do. Um, and I was actually looking for um, a background picture um, with a fire on it to make it a little, feel a little bit more of a fireside um, chat. I couldn't find one. A nice one at least. Um, so I, um, I, I kept my Aspen background. But we want to um, offer you and our speaker um, a safe space um, in which we um, want to exchange views, where we want to learn from each other, um, where, we want, where we want to meet old friends um, and also um, meet new friends. Um, and this is why we also choose to uh, do this Zoom meeting as a meeting so everybody can see each other. So who hasn't turned on um, their camera yet, um, I would like to invite you to turn it on because that makes it a lot easier um, to talk to each other um, and to exchange views and to get to know each other. So strategic litigation. Um, may seem somewhat of an abstract um, and distant concept um, to many of you, or at least to those of you ha who haven't dealt with it from an academic or a practical point of view. And um, I have to say, I belong to those people who didn't have a very clear idea what it is. And I'm seeing um, one of my team members smiling, Emily, um, I think she felt similarly when I said, let's do something about strategic litigation. It was first like, what? <laughs> about what? Um, and then when we looked into it, we were um, absolutely amazed what an important role it plays for our societies and for advancing fundamental rights. And it is a very, very great pleasure welcoming our fireside chat guest um, of today, um, who is Nani Jansen Revendlo. Nani, welcome to Aspen, to the Aspen Institute, uh, Germany. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And Nani is an award-winning human rights uh, lawyer, um, and you are specialized in strategic litigation, um, and you work at the intersection of human rights, social justice, and technology. And um, you are a founder um, and director of the Digital Freedom Fund, um, and um, you have been I mean, awarded several awards. Um, among others, you've been listed at, as a political 2021 um, a visionary tech leader in Europe. Um, and uh, not only this, um, you are currently setting up a new organization called Systemic Justice. And I'm sure that we will hear a little bit about this later on. Um, and you also teach. And I always wonder how can you get everything done in, uh, in, in 24 hours every day, but I think we, are going to hear a little bit about that too. Um, and you teach at the Columbia Law um, School and you teach at the uh, Oxford um, University. And um, I'm just very delighted uh, that you took the time being here today. It's, it's, it's wonderful and so wonderful. Uh, thank you all of you uh, for joining us for this conversation. It's, uh, it's exciting to see you. So how, how, we are, how we want to do it today, we have about an hour um, of Nani's time. Um, and I would like to kick us off um, with asking Nani a few questions and learning a little bit more about Nani. Um, and then I want to give all of you um, the floor um, to discuss um, personal issues with Nani about her personal background, um, how she got where she is, um, but also certainly also strategic um, topics 
um, about what uh, litigation, uh, what strategic litigation is or what cases Nani is working on. Um, my first question to you, Nani, is however, um, where are you currently? Are you at home or are you off? I am at home. <laughs> uh, I wish I had an office with uh, like lots of art, but but I don't. I have a nice office, but not uh, with this much art. But I'm I'm in my living room in Berlin right now. And when you look around your living room, um, what is um, one item which would describe you very well to all of us? Oh, um, I would go for the ex libris probably. Uh, so you have a little frame here with uh, three ex libris, one of my great grandfather, one uh, of my grandfather, and one that is mine. And my mother designed that one. Um, so. It has little things on there that she thought were representative of me. There is a little music note because I love opera and music. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a little plate of pasta and uh, wine because I had a huge fascination with Italy, uh, especially when I was younger. There's Lady Justice because I'm a lawyer. And then there's a globe because I used to travel an awful lot before the pandemic uh, put a stop to that. So I think that that's the, the, the most succinct description of me that you'll find in this space. <laughs> this, this is lovely. Um, that, is, um, that, that is wonderful that you shared that with us. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Nani, what, can you describe to us what strategic litigation is um, and what cases um, you have been working on in the past? Absolutely. Um, strategic litigation, the way that, that I look at it, is a litigation that can bring about bigger change, be it in law, be it in policy, be it in practice. And a crucial element there is looking at litigation as interconnected with other efforts to bring about change. So it's not just what you do in the courtroom, what you do outside the courtroom is just as important. Um, so that could be advocacy work, it could be um, campaigning, it could be policy work. And it's about figuring out a way in which all of those different efforts kind of positively reinforce each other in order to bring about bigger change. So the short version is like it's more than just a case in the courtroom. It's more than just uh, about winning your case also, because you can also have impact while not having a success in the, in the specific uh, case in the courtroom itself. Um, and it's about kind of an, it's a tool that you use in tandem with other ones to bring about change in the world. So how should we imagine this? Um, you are looking and uh, you are looking at a country. You are looking at the social uh, in inequalities or injustices. Then you are picking out a case, and then you are going for this case. <laughs> <laughs> so there are many different ways in which uh, cases can can come about. Um, so uh, one of the the landmark cases that I worked on uh, previously uh, had to do with uh, free freedom of expression. This was at my time when I was still working for an organization called Media Defense. And we defended journalists and bloggers around the world. And one of the big issues in freedom of expression is, is criminal defamation, which is basically criminalizing speech and you know, the ability to throw someone in jail for something that they said. And quite often those laws are used to suppress speech that's critical of a government, um, about a critical of public policy, basically journalists doing their work, right? Holding power to account. Um, and um, one of the regions where there are a lot of criminal defamation laws is Africa. Uh, so for a while, there was this kind of like feeling like we should have a precedent from the African court on human and people's rights, which is the equivalent of the European court uh, of human rights. Um, and then, a case presented itself. Um, there were a couple of states that had um, allowed direct access to the African court at that time. And in one of those countries, a journalist was uh, imprisoned uh, for a year for having criticized the public prosecutor in the country, and that was Burkina Faso. Uh, so this was a great opportunity to not only get justice for the journalist in question, but also set a precedent that would, be, that would have an impact across the continent. Um, I'll fast forward <laughs> to the outcome, uh, which is that we, we won the case. Um, we got um, the court to order the country in question to scrap the law of its books um, and also got the court to kind of like say that penalties uh, for speech should never uh, lead to imprisonment. Um, the great thing is that it wasn't only a victory for our client who went back to being a journalist at the time, it was also a decision that was used subsequently in other countries to strike down similar laws, to get people out of jail, etc. So this is kind of how you can create a domino effect by 
getting a precedent that others can then build on. Is uh, strategic lit litigation, Nani, is this uh, something new um, in, in its magnitude and its, in, in, in its importance, or is that something which has been done over decades or maybe centuries? Oh, well, I don't know about centuries, but uh, it definitely isn't something new. Um, it played a huge role, right, in the civil rights movement uh, in the US. And I think that that's where a lot of us kind of like know Uh, the big cases from like Brown versus Board of Education, which desegregated uh, the schooling system in the US, but also recent decisions such as Obergefell, uh, which um, uh, legitimized uh, same-sex marriage, right, in, in the US. Um, I think that uh, there's often a tendency to talk about it within Europe as if it is something new, but we have actually a quite a, a rich history of social lawyering particularly in the context of, uh, of protest, of housing, uh, et cetera. And of course, we're now seeing a huge wave of climate litigation as well, right? Um, so uh, this is something that has been really wonderful to see how, how much progress is being made there. Um, but it's also important to think that also, for example, in racial justice uh, context, um, slavery was abolished in the UK following litigation that was a court case that was said that actually led to that decision so there's actually quite a quite a big tradition also here even though it hasn't always been labeled as strategic litigation as such and um, that probably doesn't take place in a vacuum does it um, what are the what are the framework conditions the environment for strategic litigation to be successful Yeah, it absolutely doesn't take place in a, in a vacuum. And I think another thing that's really important to keep in mind is that quite often it will take a longer period of time to see the bigger change happen that you want to see. So using the climate example, again, like right now we're seeing really big wins, right? Governments are being held to account for carbon emissions. Uh, we're seeing big oil companies being held to account for the pollution that they cause. But it's really important to remember that that builds on decades of litigation, of campaigning, of filing cases, losing cases. I won't tell you how long ago it is that I went to law school, but I studied like the shell cases at the time and they were losing here. They were refiling there. They were just kind of like trying everywhere and they persisted and now they've been successful. Um, so one of the things that I think, of course, like here, this is a good example in the sense that, you know, through not only the litigation, obviously, but also the campaigning, the raising of public awareness, the overall climate has changed, you know, within society. There is, uh, there's fertile ground for these cases to be successful. And courts also feel the temperature, right? They feel the direction in which change is going at some stage. And at some stage, they just have to go along with that. And that's a really nice thing that you're seeing now. You're seeing judges making kind of like a progressive decisions that are now kind of like pushing, they're again, like creating a bit of a domino effect. You're seeing cases that are being filed on climate issues at the European Court of Human Rights being fast-tracked because there is such high focus on these issues right now and so much attention for it. Um, the, the kind of like looking at the broader picture of like, what do you need in order to be successful? Again, it depends a little bit on where you place the impact. Keeping in mind that it's quite often a, a marathon and, and not a sprint, right? It's about keeping going and trying and trying again. You have to look at impact in different ways. So it's not just about getting a positive result in the courtroom. It's also about like what impact are you having in changing uh, the narrative about an issue, uh, the reporting that you're seeing in the press or uh, public perception of specific issues. So if you kind of look at those things, you also get a different view as to like, what are the conditions that need to be in place in order to have impact, in order to have results. So it's more than just having a perfect system with perfect rule of law. You can, you can get change in, in different ways. Um, as I, this is really fascinating. Um, and uh, since you um, mentioned um, your university studies, um, Um, and, and I also announced that we would like to do it a little bit more personally. Um, I would like to ask you two a little bit more personal questions. Um, and the first one is, um, what kind of personality, what kind of personality do you need to be a successful strategic litigator? Because you just said a lot of times it's a marathon. And I think it takes a, a certain person to, um, to run a marathon. So I like to kind of like frame it as a 
realistic optimism. <laughs> so uh, the optimism that you can bring about change and kind of like having this longer term vision and the realism that it's going to take perhaps longer than you'd want uh, to actually get there. Um, and also kind of like seeing that losses in the short term don't mean that it's going to be a loss in the long term. And so there has to be some sort of, yeah, you have to be able to believe that you can help make change happen. And therefore also kind of like, yeah, the persistence <laughs> to keep on trying, even if at some of the first tries uh, you are not successful. And did you pursue cases where you were not successful? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I actually, one of the first cases, it was a case that I took over, but, uh, and it was really funny, actually, it was a case at the, um, uh, at the UN Human Rights Committee that uh, had to do also with criminal defamation um, uh, of a journalist in Kazakhstan, if I'm not mistaken. And um, this was a situation where we had a really legal technical argument, which I, I, I won't bother you with, <laughs> about whether or not the case was admissible. And I, I'd taken this case over from someone who handled it uh, at the NGO that I, that I worked at at the time before and, uh, you know, did the second round of, of submissions. And at some point, the, the, the legal officer uh, from the office of the high, um, from the office in Geneva was like, okay, so we're ready with the decision. Um, do you want your name on, on, <laughs> on the file or not? And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, like, I, it's my case, I, I own it, right? And um, he just kept me, but are you sure that you want your name on the case file? Uh, so anyway, um, long story short, my name was on there. I, and I, I was very happy to own it because I really believed in our, <laughs> in our argument. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so this was more a, a, an issue of kind of like getting access to justice, yes or no, with the UN Human Rights Committee. So fortunately, it wasn't a decision uh, on, on the substance. Um, but of course, like there's been, there's been loads of situations where, you know, you lose in first instance, or you don't win as big as, you, as you'd want. Um, I defended um, two uh, women journalists in Rwanda, uh, in the Rwanda uh, Supreme Court, uh, who had been imprisoned for 17 and seven years for having insulted the president and allegedly having denied the genocide in the country because they used framing that uh, implied that there were victims on both sides in the genocide, not denying that you know the majority of the killings was in one direction, but just kind of like using language that indicated that you know it had caused uh, deaths all around. Um, and when we appealed that to the Supreme Court there, we really hoped that because of, you know, we got a lot of international organizations also to submit amicus briefs to draw attention to the case. We hoped that the court would back down to the degree that they would, uh, you know, convert their sentence into the length of the time that they had already served. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, they did get their sentences reduced significantly, but they still had to uh, spend uh, a, at least a year in prison. And, you know, that was one of those moments when you're like, you sit at your office and, you know, you have a little cry and then you're like, okay, what are we going to do next? We file the case at the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And in the end, you know, we got, um, we got justice for them, but they did have to spend that time in jail, which was, you know, hard. Um, yeah, that's always disappointing to, to have to deal with that. Yeah. And, um... Jumping a little bit even further in your in, in your own history, um, in the beginning you told us or you showed us the picture, um, and you mentioned you were interested in opera, pasta, traveling, and justice. Um, how did you end up um, in justice um, and not in opera? Oh uh, well, for one, I can't really sing, so it's much better that I am a passive <laughs> participant in any opera theater. <laughs> that I visit, I whistle along an awful lot, but you know, the singing is really not, uh, not very well left to me. Um, so I actually studied to be a dentist originally. Um, I wanted to be a flying doctor when I was a kid. So uh, you have to be a dentist, you have to become a, an oral surgeon and you know, all the things. Um, I wanted to kind of like be one of those doctors that went to uh, developing countries and operated on cleft palates and you know all of those things turned out I didn't really like uh, studying to be a dentist so that was kind of a, an obstacle um, to find that out in year two of my studies mm -hmm. um, so then I, I I took a job and I worked for about a year as a as a recruiter for IT personnel actually and then 
decided that I found it a little bit boring um, and wanted to go back to school um, and didn't know, still didn't know then what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, so I ended up with law, which was kind of ironic because it was one of those things that when I was younger, I was always like, oh, studying law is for people who don't know what they want. Well, there I was, um, but I loved it. Uh, from the first day that I, that I went, um, went to class, uh, I just, I just, it was just so fascinating to me. I was a super nerd. I mean, I, I joined, I, I obviously went to law school a little bit later. So, and, you know, by choice <laughs> very much. And, uh, was so relieved that I was actually enjoying it that you know I ended up doing two degrees at the same time doing all the internships and anything that I that I could and yeah ended up on on this career path uh, in the end yeah. wow and is there um was there, there, there a course or a class or a professor or a case which then um, sent you on the track of uh, strategic litigation so strategic litigation was something that I kind of got to know after I left my, uh, the law firm where I did my training. Mm -hmm. So um, I went to a law firm to train uh, in Amsterdam, did corporate law there. So I did, um, I did IT and IP, and then I did litigation and arbitration. And in the course of that time, I started kind of like thinking a bit about like where to go next <laughs> once I completed my, my bar admission and got really interested in this idea of strategic litigation, but it was really hard to find any jobs there. So I saw jobs, for example, with the Open Society Justice Initiative, which required, you know, lots and lots more experience in that area than, than I had, which was zero. Um, but then I saw an opportunity that looked very similar to that with uh, media defense um, in London. Um, and this is where I kind of like actually got to build a little practice because I was the first lawyer that they hired. It was a young organization. I had a wonderful boss who, who trusted me and who gave me a lot of space to kind of like, you know, develop the work. So we went from support, financially supporting 30 cases at the start when I joined to having a docket of 130 cases of which 10% were cases that we actually litigated ourselves. Um, so, and in this context, uh, you know, beautiful work, such as the, the work that I did uh, with the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Um, I got to litigate at the European Court of Human Rights at all sorts of national courts as well. Um, and that really kind of like triggered this realization that you can use litigation creatively, right? You know, as a, as a tool for change. And uh, that set me on like the path to, you know, then spend a year at Harvard to really kind of like think about like, how does this work? How can you kind of make sure that some of the things that we did naturally in some of the cases that we worked on, getting academics on the team, uh, getting technical experts on the team, working together with activists, kind of making sure that you have all these different uh, areas of expertise represented when you're working on these cases and thinking about them, how can you encourage people to do that and what are best practices? Um, and that led to the Catalyst for Collaboration uh, project uh, that I did there. And in the past, you worked intensely on human rights, and now you're also intensely working on digital rights. Um, could you explain to us what digital rights? I mean, I'm sure we have lots of uh, participants who know exactly what it is. Um, I'm sure. But we also might have some who don't know exactly what it is. So it's always good to kind of like uh, be clear on the framing. Uh, so um, there's a traditional view of digital rights, which uh, very much focuses on privacy, data protection, uh, free speech online. And then there's a slightly more holistic view, as I like to call it, which is looking at digital rights as all human rights as engaged in the digital context. So that means not stopping at just civil and political rights, but also taking into, into account economic, social and cultural rights. Um, the nice thing, the one silver lining from this perspective, like of the pandemic has been that this has become a lot more relatable, right, for everyone kind of like having to engage with technology so much more uh, during this time for access to schooling, to, for, for many of us to be able to work, uh, to access healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. So there's hardly any aspects of our lives at the moment where technology doesn't play some sort of role. And that also means that our human rights are implicated in all of those different arenas of our lives. So this is what we think about when we, we talk about digital rights. I think I have um, used all my allotted time in asking you questions, <laughs> although I do have tons of more. Um, and I would like to open it up now to all of our participants. But first of all, I would also like to say hello to Kimberly. 
Hello, Kimberly. And Hello. I'm doing so because Kimberly, um, uh, Kimberly set me up with none. Um, <laughs> Kimberly was our last um, fireside chat um, guest. Um, and when we talked to each other afterwards, she said, well, I know the perfect person um, who you should have for the next fireside chat. <laughs> so thank you so much, Kimberly. <laughs> Hi, Nanny. Hi, so good to see you. And um, what I would like to do for the first round of questions, um, we do have quite a few younger participants also um, among our participants. And I would like to give them the first opportunity um, to ask a question. Um, so I'm, for example, seeing one of our team members, um, our one of our student assistants, um, Marlies, also already um, raising her hand. And maybe Ina also wants to say something. Marlies. Hi, uh, yes. Um, first of all, thank you so much. Um, it was very impressive what you explained to us. Um, I was wondering, because you were pointing out that raising public awareness about a case obviously helps the strategic litigation process. So is there like a specific type of public awareness or so like a big petition going around or demonstrations that you find particularly helpful? And I also wanted to ask, like, in what sectors you see strategic litigation um, being more successful due to public awareness. For instance, you mentioned um, climate litigation. So for instance, Fridays for Future, is that more successful than, for instance, um, strategic litigation cases that try to combat racism, sexism, et cetera? Great, excellent questions. So um, on what type of public awareness is most helpful? It really depends on the context and the type of change that you're trying to bring about. Um, so. I mentioned at the outset, like strategic education can try to bring about change in, in, in law, in policy, in practice. And that also influences like who the stakeholders are that you'd want to, want to influence. Um, so for example, this petition that you mentioned uh, could be helpful if it pushes lawmakers to actually start changing legislation or um, going out in the streets can help if it helps raise public awareness if that is what you're trying to do. So it depends a little bit on the context in which you're operating, what is what is most helpful. Um, and yeah, and what will influence which stakeholders that you that you actually want to kind of like get get moving. Um, and your other question about like areas in which a strategic litigation is particularly helpful. So I get, I'm going to give it a slight twist and kind of say like it could be helpful in so many contexts and it's not being used in all contexts that it could be used. Um, so, um, so far, I think most of the, the successes that you see are in the area of uh, civil and political rights and also in the area indeed like now of climate change, but again, building on decades, right, of, of, of previous work. And um, actually in the, in the, in the areas of, of, of racial justice, for example, it's not being used as much as it could be. And this is one of the things that I'm, I'm working on right now is, is on developing a new initiative to actually make that happen uh, more often. So really kind of like figuring out ways to kind of uh, to facilitate community driven strategic litigation to bring about to kind of like break down some of those bigger power structures that are kind of holding us back from 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 more equitable societies at the moment. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm, I know that you all are very aware um, how you raise your electronic hand. Um, I still want to be, aha. <laughs> Ina, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, yeah, I also have a question um, and I just wanted to say um, thank you very much for coming. I actually um, recently graduated from the University of Amsterdam. I'm also planning to uh, go into public international law. So uh, this is a very um, exciting um, Zoom meeting for me. Um, and I just wanted to ask you about the new organization that you're setting up. Um, and you say that, that you aim to broaden judicial remedies for individuals. Um, and I just wanted to ask you kind of if you could explain a little bit what the problem is and how this problem can be improved. And then also what the role of international law or human rights law would be in uh, doing so. Great. Thank you so much for this question. And, you know, uh, came from the University of Amsterdam myself. So really <laughs> extra nice to see you here. <laughs> um, so um, 
the idea be behind the organization uh, I'm, I'm working on setting up right now, which is, is called uh, Systemic Justice, is to kind of radically reimagine access to justice. Um, so what I've been seeing over the past 15 years, engaging in litigation, supporting litigation now at the Digital Freedom Fund, is again like this wonderful potential that strategic litigation has to bring about structural change, but it not being used as much for issues of racial, social, and economic justice. I think that one of the reasons that this is so is um, because overall, the dynamics still tend to be very Approach to the litigation is, oh, is there something going on? Your sound is not so good. Okay. Maybe. Can you hear me now or is this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I don't know what's going on. This is my MacBook just kind of deciding to switch microphones for some reason. I apologize. I apologize on behalf of my MacBook. Um, that there tends to be a very, uh, very much a focus on like the, the black letter law uh, approach, right? What is possible in court? Um, what can we do and what are the kinds of arguments that are going to make us win before the specific uh, judge, rather than looking at the bigger picture, like what is the bigger change that we want to see in the world um, and how, what is the role that litigation can play in this process, right? Because I really very much think that you should look at bringing about bigger change as a process, again, this marathon <laughs> instead of a sprint. So I guess if you're going to kind of take that equation, the focus is too much on the sprint right now. It's too much on the sprint. It's too much on the black letter law. Um, and also there's a difficulty quite often from the legal profession to really kind of like engage with what movements want and uh, you know, how they want to frame their issue. Um, so there's a disconnect there. And uh, what I want to work towards is actually community driven strategic litigation. So where you really kind of like look together at this bigger picture, what is this bigger change you want to bring about what role can litigation play in strengthening efforts that are already there? So again, like advocacy, raising public awareness, campaigning, policy work, et cetera. And then figure out together, like, how are we going to get there? And then holistically think about the strategy, making joint decisions, agreeing on the communication strategy, et cetera, et cetera, to really kind of make this a holistic uh, collaboration. Um, so this is, this, is, <laughs> this is where we're heading. Um, we're still very early stages, uh, very excited about it. Besides like working on litigation, we also want to build a community of practice with other lawyers, uh, with other organizations that are doing amazing litigation in this space. Uh, I see Vivienne there, for example, from the European Roma Rights Center, who have done such amazing work in Central and Eastern Europe in particular on Roma rights. Um, and organizations like that, systemic justice, uh, OSJI, et cetera, we can all kind of like, you know, join forces and kind of like make sure that this becomes a, a much better landscape for, for more grassroots movements. Thank you so much, um, Nani. Um, there were two persons writing in the chat who just wanted to thank you um, before they had to go. And they, one of them said that um, she missed your course um, at Columbia. Um, <laughs> Might have been yeah, one of your Laura, Laura was <laughs> in the first time I, I taught there. She was one of my students. That's so ah, nice. I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and with this, I hand over to Fiona and then afterwards to uh, Hinako. Yeah, thank you. Hello, Nani. Thank you for your speech. Um, I just had a question because I am a French trainee lawyer and I worked a bit on strategic litigation with CCHR. Um, and I just, I was just wondering, how do you decide on the right victim? Because all, like, usually with strategic litigation, we have this thought about thinking about the right kind of victim, like the victim is going to go up to the end and go through all the procedure. But what, what do you do when you have a victim who wants to settle, for example? How do you choose your victim? And basically, what do you do when the strategic litigation kind of goal overcome the, the goal of the victim? Thank you. Very good question, Fiona. And uh, yeah, so what, it, it, again, like, you know, as, as, a, as a, annoyingly as a lawyer, the answer is always, it all depends, but let me actually give you an, an answer. Um, so what, what we've done in the past to kind of like mitigate for this quote unquote risk and you know that's actually not the right label for it because it's it's a situation right where you know you see you see a bigger interest that that needs to be pursued your client was 
on board for that. And then at some point, those two <laughs> interests are, are kind of like no longer heading in the same direction, which is very legitimate, right? You know, being involved in, in legal proceedings can be really exhausting for people. People have their own reasons for, for sometimes not wanting to pursue it. Um, one of the ways that we've we've tried we've I've tried, I've tried like two different models for this. Besides, of course, you know, having all the conversations beforehand that doesn't mitigate for the fact that circumstances change and you have to adjust course. But in order to not be left with a with a moot <laughs> case, basically, um, there's different ways, right, of involving uh, the people that are affected in the case. So perhaps not having them act as claimants. It depends, of course, on the legal system that you have, whether or not that's a requirement in order to have standing. Um, but um, the ideal situation there is that you would have multiple people involved so that there's a group, there's a collective that even if one or two people decide to step back, there, there is still sufficient ground to kind of go on and pursue the, the principled issue. Another thing is like, if the jurisdiction allows for it, um, uh, have individual claimants um, appear alongside NGOs. So if there's any any entities that can kind of like represent on this particular issue, it's really nice to put them alongside there. It's particularly helpful in context where there can be there can be you know undue pressure <laughs> on uh, on claimants uh, because the the political environment is 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 tense. Um, and another way is kind of like looping them out as claimants altogether, if that's again if this is possible in the jurisdiction, and rather kind of like have their have their voices included uh, through witness testimonies, et cetera, and kind of like have them be part of the evidence. Um, so those are kind of like the pragmatic uh, ways, um, I think, <laughs> that exist of, of approaching this. But again, it, it always depends on the context, right, that you're litigating in and what the, what the boundaries are there. But there, there are different ways of being creative um, about it, I think. I have to unmute myself, I'm so sorry. Um, and over to Hinako. Thank you so much, first of all, this fabulous opportunity. I'm really enjoying the time. And I'm a qualified lawyer in Japan and um, I happen to uh, managing uh, that, like digital rights litigators network, uh, like a global litigators network. And then, but um, communicating with uh, litigators uh, in each jurisdiction, I started to feel like I really want to do litigation again back in Tokyo in this rights area or human rights protection. But the, the biggest hurdle gonna be like funding issue. Um, and also, um, so I'd say we share a lot of culture with like Korea or China. So we don't have the like climate to criticize the authority or the government. So it really needs to like, um, I, I have to do tons of work to like public awareness raising in terms of the funding and also that like making the climate thing. So, but the reason why I became a lawyer was, um, I mean, I'm good at um, rather than like public awareness, but rather fighting using the logic um, against the majority. What the majority is thinking. So in relation to your Catalyst project, um, did you face any sort of a challenge when you do some public awareness work compared to like legal, uh, typical like lawyering work? So that's my question. Oh gosh, that's a really great question. And um, I'm so glad that the network is still very much thriving. <laughs> um, I, I was at MLDI at the time when we set that up together with Access Now. Um, so um, Gosh, so I'm not a campaigner, right? So this is this is a really hard question for me as a lawyer, <laughs> just in general. So campaigning in general is 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 hard for me. But I have had certain situations where um, it was really good to kind of like add a campaigning component to a case that I was working on, and I was focusing on the legal bit of it. Um, I think that the hardest thing sometimes was navigating the different um, the different standpoints of the different organizations that were involved. Um, you would have everyone wanting to run it by their, their legal counsel. Uh, there's this word that we can't use for this organization. There's that word that we can't use for that organization. And kind of getting a public statement together is, is, is pretty difficult. Um, that is one thing. And then the other thing that I found um, that I found challenging is kind of like connecting some of these issues and connecting their importance to the general audience, right? Um, 
we obviously live in a world where there are so many things that require our attention um, that could use improvement. And it's really difficult sometimes to kind of like really draw attention to a specific case or a specific cause and kind of like making it relatable to people that this is something that they need to prioritize over all those other things that are kind of clamoring for their attention. Um, I have no answers as to how to do that. That's that's a skill set <laughs> that other people have. Um, but it is one of the one of the crucial things in the end, right? And this is why it's so important to have this cross disciplinary collaboration so that everybody can bring in their own strengths. Um, you know, it's it's one thing to kind of like see the bigger picture and know what's needed, and another thing to make sure that you have the right people to work with to execute those different elements. Um, since we, we are talking a little bit of, about campaigning now, um, yes. I, I know that um, Kimberly, you are also intensely working on human rights um, and um, you are also um, a, a legal scholar, but you're also very much aware of how campaigning works. Um, maybe you can also jump in and say and contribute um, to that question. Well, I mean, the I'm with Human Rights Watch and um, this is actually how I know Nanny. And Nanny, thank you so much and, Ma and Stormy for this really, really interesting. I feel like I can continue to learn more and more and more all the time about the work you're doing. And, um, you know, it's, um, you know, it's when you're, when you're campaigning, it's actually, uh, it's, it's actually a kind of like strategic communications in a way. It's not strategic litigation, but it's strategic communications. So, you know, where, where do you, uh, after you have your underlying information and your facts about the uh, violations or abuse that you want to stop or change, you know, where do you actually um, press the buttons and try to bring, uh, shine a light globally or locally um, that will make a difference, um, that will start to create some of the environment that Nanny needs in order to actually um, build support for her litigation. And so there, I think they're very complementary types of work. And then of course, um, once we have the, the reports and we've strategically um, placed them, figured out how to bring attention to them, we take them to the policymakers. So instead of going up through the courts, which is like I would say Nanny's end game because that's where she really wants to see the policy changed. Um, and she's got all these different paths along the way. And sometimes she gets to the courts and sometimes she doesn't need to. We go directly to the policymakers and we go to the top and say, okay guys, um, you know, here are the levers, um, name and shame. Um, you, you know, and change your, here are our recommendations on what you should change. So it's, it's, it's kind of trying to get it similar solutions through different paths. Um, and, and frankly, there's many ways up the mountain. And, um, I think that, uh, what, what I really like about what Nanny's doing is, um, very much the grassroots side of it, that the, the kind of community, the, building the network of people with aligned interests, which I think is incredibly important in order to create a groundswell. But um, one quick example of how uh, we use the type of work we do um, is vis-a-vis -vis Bolsonaro and the rainforest. Um, we, we did a report the year before last um, on the threats and the, uh, deaths of indigenous forest rangers um, in the Amazon, because that is definitely a human rights, uh, you know, concern, huge human rights concern. And of course, for us, we're not just going to go out there and campaign for climate change. We're going to go out there and um, look at what are the human rights aspects of this. And one of the levers that we've been using is to get European uh, countries and governments not to sign this big important trade agreement for Brazil until he makes commitments and promises that um, you know we there are results and there there are actually changes that happen in Brazil and it's called the Mercosur Agreement and some of you may be familiar with it but it got ratified at the EU but we have been working 
you know, one on one with the biggest governments to get him. So that's a different way of kind of peeling the apple, if you will. So anyway, I, I'm just so I'm so it's so fascinating to see how all these pieces fit together. Thank you so much um, for for adding that, uh, Kimberly. Um, back to you, Nani, and then I hand over to Asita. No, I, I just want to say thank you, <laughs> Kimberly, for for sharing that. And um, it's so important to kind of like think that think about the fact that all of these different efforts, like in different corners, they all matter, right? I mean, there's there's the campaigning part, and there's like indeed like going to the policymakers and persuading them to do elsewhere. Sometimes the you know finding a case can help put additional pressure there. Then there's also the inside, you know connection like what is happening within government there's diplomatic pressure like there's all these different things that kind of have to come together quite often in order to for bigger things to to shift thank you so much um before i hand over to asita just just one second um i want to give some of our participants an early warning um, that i would like to bring them into the conversation because um apart from the strategic litigation community um, and human rights community who's with us today. We also have our Aspen leadership community um, here with us today. So I'm seeing Britta, I'm seeing Margit, um, I'm seeing Ulrich, I'm seeing Jan. And um, those are members of ours who are thinking very much about responsible value-based leadership. Um, and I think Nani is also a person who could say something about responsible leadership and value-based leadership. So jump in, please, um, afterwards. Okay, and I see the first hand coming up. So first to Asita and then to Ulrich. Thank you very much um, for your talk, uh, Nani. I am working for the German National Human Rights Institute, and I'm a lawyer myself. And one of the issues that I that I wanted to discuss or um, bring to your attention as well as um, the challenges that we are facing with the victims themselves. I think the psychological challenges, especially because strategic litigation processes take such a long time. And in my experience, very often much more time than usual um, cases. Mm -hmm. Um, is extremely challenging and in addition in most of the cases we know that by the current law they won't win so many times you do them knowing that under the law itself they're not winning but you want to do this to change the law to change the situation and I find it extremely challenging like when you look at examples like indigenous peoples whose lands were taken and you want to have an immediate solution now, you want them to stop taking the land, you want them to settle back and their children to settle back, but you know it may take 10 years and until then they probably won't get it back or the land is completely destroyed. Um, it's so challenging. So I wanted to ask you more about how you deal with these uh, psychological issues on both sides, like for your own well-being, the lawyer's well-beings, but also the victims, if you have special measures for that. Or... Excellent, excellent question. I'm really glad that you raised that because it's quite often under, <laughs> under discussed <laughs> in this field. Um, so I have to be frank and kind of like say that in my kind of like past of, of, of being a litigator myself and, um, and working with clients, um, this was not a very prominent aspect of the, of the work that we did. It was very much old school, you know, lawyering, focusing on getting the work done, focusing on winning. Now in the way that I'm thinking about systemic justice, I'm thinking about this rather differently because I see the shortcomings of that approach. Um, and I think that you, you don't use the wording exactly, but I think you're referring to the fact that kind of also engaging in litigation can be really re-traumatizing for communities, right? Because they have to kind of like relive really traumatic experiences in order to kind of like tell their story, et cetera. So I was very is, careful to, yeah. <laughs> to use it or not. Yeah. Uh, have, a, have a Dutch person, they will just, they will just say, <laughs> say what's, what it is. Um, so, um, there are two aspects of, of this that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about very much as, as, as we kind of like build the new initiative. One is indeed kind of making sure that in the process of working with the communities that there's actually this psychosocial support uh, provided. Um, so as I've been thinking about like what our litigation budgets should look like, et cetera, this is, this is a, a robust budget line in there. 
uh, besides also making sure that there's capacity to assist with community organizing, et cetera, this aspect of the work really needs to be in there too. I'm also thinking about this for my own team uh, because, um, well, especially if you're going to work on issues of racial, social, and economic justice, you know, it often also becomes very personal. Uh, also kind of like relating to the question uh, that was entered in the chat, like, there, there is, there's the, there's the aspect of kind of like navigating a system that still, you know, that still very much looks a certain way, that still very much behaves a certain way, um, uh, and you know, to 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 kind of be uh, as forthcoming there as I was just now about uh, using the word trauma. Those are white spaces, right? And uh, wanting to build a team that is truly diverse. This is kind of like engaging with systems that are still very much dominated by whiteness. So this in and of itself is, is heavy lifting to do, but then also dealing with issues that actually can sometimes be rather personal or close to home for people can also be very impactful. So I also want to make sure that the team kind of has support in, in, in a similar way. Um, so yeah, so this, uh, it's a very good point and it's, it's very much something that I'm trying to, to think about, um, yeah, how to do that better actually. Yeah. And that brings us um, immediately um, also to Ulrich, um, who is one, one of our members, very active, um, very supportive of Aspen um, Germany. Um, Ulrich, the floor is yours. Hello, Nani. I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> one of the few, I believe. <laughs> uh, and my question is, I would like to, to get an idea where strategic litigation is very yeah, the word successful is not so good, but where it's practiced a lot, especially, uh, you know, thinking of uh, injustices or injustice happens many times in countries where the legal system is not that open, like, uh, for example, Hungary, Poland, Russia, or there are many other countries mm -hmm. where especially there, there would be a certain need for strategic litigation, but uh, have you done strategic litigation in such countries where it's difficult to jump on a case or to get a case or to, to find yeah, a legal yeah. system where you can base on? Yeah, very good question. Uh, worked in all of the countries that you mentioned and, 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 and a couple more. Like we're, we're obviously not in a very good place in Europe at the moment um, uh, where a lot of our <laughs> democratic systems are, are ever so slightly unraveling. Um, this goes back to the question, like, where do you want to have your impact? Um, and what is the kind of impact that you want to have? In, in situations where you don't have a great rule of law system, you should probably kind of like focus on a different kind of impact. Um, so again, like the, 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 the factors that we talked about before, like influencing public opinion, changing narratives, etc. cetera. Uh, another kind of like um, way to look at it is, is, is kind of like creating a record Right. Um, so taking things through a formal system that kind of like creates a record of what the findings are, what the situation in the country is, what the findings are, etc., can be helpful in the longer, longer term. It can be part of a bigger strategy of basically kind of like building your case file or building your, your uh, trove of evidence, if I can put it that way. Um, the other point is that, of course, like within the Council of Europe area, we still have the European Court of Human Rights uh, to go to, even though there's always the caveat, right, that implementation of those decisions is a whole different <laughs> conversation and quite often can take um, quite some time. Um, there is kind of like a, a point of last resort there. And again, like there's the added value there of, of yeah, um, recording uh, human rights violations. Um, it's putting states on notice. Um, it also has an impact kind of on the political perception uh, of how a certain government is behaving. And another thing that's kind of like under, um, under discussed or under highlighted, I don't know how you say that actually, um, quite often is the fact that of court orders, quite often the reparations factor is followed up on by a lot of states. So there is quite often like some sort of uh, yeah, reparations being paid, which is of course not the same as kind of bringing about systemic change that you're going for. Um, but there is some sort of form of retribution, which can sometimes be satisfaction for, uh, for human rights victims as well. Um, so again, like, you know, get my, 
it all kind of depends, but uh, <laughs> there are different, different, different um, aspects of the, of the picture to, to look at. Unfortunately, we are now really, really running short of time. So I will take the last two questions and I will take them together before I hand over um, to you again, Nani. So next on my list is Adi and then um, Jan, Jan Lohsemann. Thank you. Um, hi, Nani. Um, my question um, relates also to success metrics, but specifically um, one of the success metrics that I imagine is building resilience in the communities that you are working with. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious as to how you see that being, well, if you see that as a success metric and where you've seen that be the outcome, that the those communities are stronger um, and that some of the, this knowledge stays within those communities as well. Because I guess one of my concerns, um, taking it via these formal paths, they have it has all the benefits you just highlighted, but it doesn't necessarily translate to a strengthening of those communities. Instead, it's almost a, a dependence on these formal systems for validation mm -hmm. um, without necessarily building resilience. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Great question. Can I answer that or do, should I wait for another question, Stormy? What is that? <laughs> I think we have to take Jan on board too. And okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'll try to be very quick. Thank you so much, Nani. Being my, as a lawyer, by myself in my own small firm, this is uh, dealing mainly with business issues. This is very impressive for me, the work you're doing. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about a, a cliche, which I wonder if it's true. Um, when I'm looking at the spectators today, uh, knowing that we have many male members in our association, I see many women, uh, actually a majority. So I wonder if these rather soft issues like human rights, um, as we may call them, is in your own world of NGOs um, and human rights movement. Is Do you observe that there are more female um, participants or are, do we, would you say it's rather equal? And on the other hand, on the opposite side, so maybe if you're dealing with some dictatorships and they have their own lawyers or law firms, do you think, are, are there more men? Is that something um, that you observe? And the, join, uh, uh, just on that, on top of that, I wanted to ask if, um, if you are also having some uh, cooperations with big international law firms or big international lobbying firms who have all this power and the private jets you need and they can go <laughs> everywhere in the world like you know you see in those Hollywood movies. Are you joining with them? Are they, are they doing a little bit of pro bono work to support you in your work? <laughs> okay, great. So uh, I'm going to take the questions in reverse. <laughs> so, so about big law firms, yes, absolutely. Uh, pro bono support can be super, super helpful, um, particularly when there's huge research work that needs to be done. It can be a huge uh, addition to the capacity uh, of NGOs. Um, it very much depends, you know, like what, what you can ask, because uh, the, the skill set quite often is very different within corporate firms. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a matter of kind of finding that sweet spot where it's both um, beneficial to the big firm and also to the NGO that's, that's seeking the support. But um, I've had wonderful collaborations also in some of the actual litigation that I did in the past with, um, with law firms, um, actually to the point that we went to the African court together, we went to the East African Court of Justice together, European court. Uh, and that was really fruitful collaboration. I think a lot of it also, as in many things in life, depends on the individuals that you're, that you're involved with. Um, on uh, kind of like talking about uh, human rights as a, a, as a soft issue, I, I'm going to have to push back on that. I mean, uh, a lot of the issues we're talking about are, are life and death uh, quite often. And I say that smiling, but it's really serious. I mean, death in police custody for racialized communities is not a soft issue. Inadequate healthcare for women and particularly women of color is not a soft issue. And I can go on like that. So uh, I'm really happy that there are lots of women uh, fighting this fight. Um, you know, um, perhaps biased, but uh, I think that, that women have an awful lot to bring and uh, also have a wonderful stamina for this uh, marathon that we're, we're running together. So um, I'm, 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 I'm very happy to be quite often in, 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 in the company of women in this field. Um, 
Going back to Ade's question uh, about building resilience in communities, um, I don't want to put Vivian on the spot, but maybe she wants to actually add to that uh, after I, I give my first uh, two cents on this. Um, I, I agree with you that that you know if you approach this in the traditional way, this remains perhaps a disconnected uh, tool uh, to communities. But this is actually exactly the bridge that we want to make, right? Looking at it from a community-driven uh, perspective. One of the strands of work that we want to undertake is indeed building power within communities so that they better know what strategic litigation can and cannot do for them so that they can make informed choices about this, be it with the, if they work with us, if they work with someone else, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It's about actually knowing what the options are and also therefore what to negotiate. Another thing that I foresee is actually that these collaborations will be like really hands on so that, you know, so to speak, COVID permitting, you basically spend time together in the office on a regular basis, right? And this way, this actually, this includes this actually participation in the, in the processes itself is going to be knowledge that people can take away to whichever next endeavor they, they want to undertake. But Vivian can maybe add to this, am I, am I seeing correctly from your body language that you're happy to, to jump in? Hi everyone, thank, thank you Nani, thank you. Yeah, so I work for the European Roma Rights Center, which is a public interest law organization uh, focusing on, on human, rights, human rights litigation, strategic litigation to combat anti-Roman racism. Uh, and human rights violations of from many people. And our ap ap approach is actually um, something which is quite close to the grass grassroots approach. I wouldn't say that it's definitely grassroots because uh, um, at the end of the day, we have an office in Brussels um, and especially during the COVID, we are working from home. Uh, we are based in Brussels. We are a big international NGO, but our main aim is actually to, to have a constant um, uh, connection with the community or I wouldn't say constant as on a personal level, but through um, communicators, human rights monitors. And, uh, and as um, Nani also said, um, we think about the work we do and the work that we have with the communities that that we are a tool and we are trying to, to give information for the community and we want to give them the informed choice how they would like to go further with different options. So uh, the work we do is a tool basically for them to decide whether they would like to go along. And, and I really like that recently there was a shift in this approach because uh, for, for a long period of time, um, individuals or communities were used as a tool to achieve uh, that certain social um, change. And I this is, why I adore Nanny's idea and uh, the new the idea of her new organization that she's setting up that there will be a, a bigger um, focus or the focus will be on the community. So um, that, that I think that's all that I, I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, Nanny. And probably a thing to kind of like add to that, right, is that litigation isn't necessarily the right choice for everyone or for every yeah. situation, for every community. And um, so again, <laughs> can we go again? It all depends. But it's a, it's a situation specific analysis, right, that you have to that you have to apply to this. And uh, at least knowing that the option is there and knowing that you can do it in a way that that, you know, is right is right for you and for your interest and truly kind of like speaks with the voice and with the terminology that you want is is, is something um, yeah that, that that isn't really that mainstream right now and and, and that we want to change ah there are so many more questions i have and every i mean i see monica nodding um and I wish we had more than an hour, but I can also, also see that some of our participants had to leave us because we announced it would only be an hour. Um, thank you so very, very much, Nan, um, for being so generous with your time. And I hope that we will have you again in the future to ask you um, even more questions, <laughs> pick your brain um, on human rights and where we are moving and how to collect evidence. and. Ah, there are so many more topics I would like to touch upon. And I, um, I just want to say thank you so much. This has been amazing this last hour. Thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation and 
excellent questions. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, that doesn't always happen, so I'm, I'm, I'm overjoyed. That's really great. <laughs> and one very last question, though, um, and this is this brings us back to personal issues. Um, and I would like to know, let's say, two more things from you and <laughs> two recommendations. So when we want to um, learn a little bit more about strategic litigation or what you do, is there a book you could recommend us to take a look at? Oh, gosh. Um, so I'm going to not recommend a strategic litigation book. There, there's a wonderful book uh, written by Helen Duffy, actually, about strategic litigation. That is the book. So you can learn everything about it in that. But if you want to rethink uh, partnerships, et cetera, in this area, I actually recommend reading a book that deals with a technological design <laughs> and it's called Design Justice. Mm -hmm. It really uh, looks at uh, developing technology in a community participatory way. And a lot of the principles that are applicable in that context are also applicable when rethinking a collaboration around litigation. So that would be my, my reading tip. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. And very last question, your favorite opera, which is about justice. <laughs> oh, well, it's, that was kind of more poetic justice, right? In opera, it's always, <laughs> it's always tragic. My favorite opera is Rigoletto. Um, if that's a just outcome, uh, that is something to be debated, I suppose. But uh, yeah, I'm a big Verdi fan. So, uh, and this is the one that I always come back to. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Let's all, all of us give uh, Nani a big applause and a big thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. It was really a pleasure. And we will see you hopefully soon at our next fireside chat. Um, and we'll wonderful. keep you posted um, what we are going to cover next. And thanks so much for my team um, for putting this together tonight. To Emily, to Monica, to Ina, to Marlies. Um, you guys are great. And good night, everybody.